Thank you, church family, for a beautiful Sabbath day today and for your kind words uh, through the card I got earlier this month, thanks to Mary, or a uh, presentation today from Starla, from Tracy. <sighs> Not so sure about that video, though. <laughs> that was quality, exactly what you would expect from Pastor Charles, which is why I'm glad to have him on the team, too, which makes it awkward to have a member of the pastoral team conspiring against the other pastor for Pastor Appreciation Month, but... That's what you get when you have to deal with Charles. Anyway, um, and Liz and Tracy and some of those other shenanigan-causing people. Stephanie, Aaron, Rhonda, yeah, all of those people. Um, so anyway, church family, I want to thank you. Uh, and I know that pastor appreciation is more than just something you do one Saturday, uh, once a year. But I've felt your appreciation throughout this entire year. And so just thank you for making it easy to be your pastor. Because especially, I'll note, as we've had a chance to study through the epistles, we recognize that not all churches get along well with their pastor. So I am glad that things are still going very well with you guys, and uh, I'm glad that we can continue to be here to make memories with you, to connect with you, and, and to love each other, but also point to Jesus. All right, so... As we're doing our series, I made reference to the fact that we are studying through Paul's letters. We've had a chance to look at some of the unsolicited messages that we receive. Putting ourselves in the shoes of people who receive those messages, even jokingly talking about some of the spam emails we get, or some of the undesirable messages that we'll receive known as bills. Uh, but every once in a while, it's good to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who send those messages. In fact, one of the, the simplest messages that some of you send from time to time could be as simple as those three beautiful words, how are you? And one of the great things about the message, how are you, is because you already know what the answer is. What is the answer when you ask somebody, how are you? Fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> that is the default answer in America. In fact, I've heard people joke about the fact that when I ask you how you are, I don't really want to know how you are. I, I just want to acknowledge that you're there and I don't want to just say hi. So we, oh, what's he up to now? Nothing. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to work harder than that. Uh, <laughs> In fact, the idea of how are you and fine is the reason why I recently read in a book, recently as in like a couple of years ago, but still, I read in a book by a lady named Sheryl Sandberg that she actually was encouraged to change her vocabulary in the immediate aftermath of the sudden death of her husband. Sheryl Sandberg, if you've never heard the name, is current, I believe she's still currently Mark Zuckerberg's number two at Facebook. She is one of the chief operating officers at Facebook, having come from being one of the chief executives at Google. She is a high-powered leader in the tech industry, but even the high-powered leaders of the tech industry are not immune from this world of sin. Because unfortunately, several years ago, she and her husband decided to have a adult's weekend away. She and, a few other, she and her husband and a few other couples decided to sneak away to go off to Mexico you know, as normal people do, left the kids behind, and they went off to a beautiful, all-inclusive resort. Her husband said, I want to go work out at the gym. And she says, I want to go take a nap because it's Mexico. <laughs> I want to go take a nap on the beach somewhere. And they said, fine, I'll meet you at dinner. But unfortunately, he never made it to dinner. She waited for him could not find him, looked for him, could not find him, found him in the weight room that was unsupervised by himself where he had had a heart attack during his exercises. And she had to go home, mourning her own grief, mourning her own loss, and to tell her children that dad's not coming home. And so she struggles with the grief and the loss in the morning. And so she wrote a book. There's actually a ministry. It's optionb.com, referring to the fact that at one point in her life, 
They were getting ready to have a family friend come and help one of their children go to, you know, one of these daddy-daughter, father-son kind of events. And they were going to have a family friend come and stand in. And she's like, but I don't want a family friend to stand in. I want my husband, I want, my, I want their dad to be there. And the friend had to give them the unfortunate news. The reminder that option A is not available. And so we're going to do the best we can with option B. And so she goes through her own process of grieving and mourning. She works with a professional counselor. You can afford the best when you are Cheryl Sandberg. Uh, and so this book is a great resource for not only people who are going through grief, but also for people who are, grie- or who are ministering to those who are in grief as well. And she encouraged me, don't ask this word when you reach out to somebody who's going through the aftermath. You may have noticed it, some of you, when I've reached out to you recently. Because I know you guys have gone through hard times. I don't ask you how are you because I know the answer you're supposed to give is fine. The answer or the question that I will ask you is, how are you today? Because that gives you permission to say today is terrible, but maybe tomorrow will be better. You can be honest about today because today can be a hard day. You might have had a bad night of sleep last night. You may have had through, you're just going through hard times, whatever it is. If I were to ask you how you're doing, you'll notice for many of you, I'll ask you, how are you doing today? And your permission is to say, awful. In fact, I stumbled across this recently. When somebody asks, how are you doing? A simple communication, another option is to communicate with hearts in response. And for those of you who are on Instagram, I will be sharing this on my Instagram story so you can grab a copy of it. But this is a really cool code that goes everything from a red heart response means I'm doing really great, pretty good, okay, I guess. I'm starting to struggle. I'm having a really hard time. I need support. And that is okay. But every once in a while, just a simple message of I'm thinking of you can have a profound impact. How many of you, for example, have received just a random message from somebody in your life or ever sent, if you've you've ever been the recipient of one of those letters, one of those simple messages, how are you? How did it make your day feel? How did it make you feel to hear from somebody who's just reaching out and thinking of you? Made an impact, didn't it? Now, one of the notes that I did find is that it is helpful (laughs) when you respond to be in the position to respond appropriately, which is why I had such a good laugh at this, and I figured you'd appreciate it too. It says, it's good to have friends who check up on you. Are you okay? And the friend responds, no. And the friend immediately responds, okay, good, just checking. (laughs) Now, all of this conversation of checking in on you, want to see how you're doing, of course, this is not a new phenomenon, and we're doing it in the context of our series of the letters from Paul to his churches. This is what the church, or the message to the people of Thessalonica, known as 1 Thessalonians, is all about. This is Paul's opportunity to check in on a church, to see how they're doing, and to give them encouragement a little bit more than just simply, how are you doing? Bad. Okay, cool, just checking. But he actually has a chance to put some, uh, put some uh, oomph behind it and support and encouragement behind it. He wants to respond appropriately to people who may be going through hard times. And the message that he gives in this simple five-chapter book is, Dear friend, the gospel is your past, present, and future. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, I know that we've had a chance to to celebrate pastors. Well, we are thankful as well for the one who is truly the head of this church. And so we celebrate you, Lord Jesus. As we worship you through songs and through stories and, of course, through your scriptures. Lord, I just pray that you would be here. Give us the encouragement and help us to know how to encourage others as well. Lord, speak to us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so map of the, uh, 
of the Mediterranean Sea. Want to make sure, especially because we have some friends who are visiting for the first time or back for the first time in a while. Want to make sure we're all on the same page. This is, of course, the Mediterranean. You see bits of three different continents represented here, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And you see, uh, if you're trying to orient yourself up in the top left corner, there's that boot that's kicking that island. That, That country is... Italy. Immediately next to that, across the, across the sea, you have the, the modern nation of Greece. Across that little, uh, the other sea, you end up in that little peninsula sticking out. That is modern-day Turkey, formerly Asia Minor, and all of its cities and, and regions and territories. And we've had a chance to explore messages that have been written to uh, several of the cities across this region. We've had a chance to study the message to Rome and Corinth and Galatia, uh, you, had, you remember our, our message to the city of Galatia? No, because it's not a city. That was a region. Good job. You're, you might be paying attention. We've had a chance to study the message to Ephesus, to, to Colossae. Uh, that was last week's message from Pastor Charles, was the message to the Colossian people. We've also looked at the, the Philippian community, which is up on the, the northern side there. And in fact, as we zoom in on that territory, you, you see the city of Philippi on the north side of the Aegean Sea. And you'll see a few other familiar face, their names, and one of them in particular is what we're talking about today. We're talking about Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Uh, so let's start with Philippi. We had a chance to explore back in Acts chapter 16, where Paul ministered to the people of Philippi, where he had a chance to cross over the Aegean Sea and into the European continent, and he had a chance to convert people with the gospel. Do you remember... Who the first person converted in Europe was? I told you this was a Bible trivia question, and here's the trivia. It's Lydia, that's right, the seller of purple that he found there in Acts chapter 16. When they arrived in Macedonia, when they they went to Philippi, they went out on a Sabbath morning and they met Lydia. Now, did things go well immediately after this? Unfortunately, no. You may know, if you had a chance to look at the book of Acts at all, that Acts chapter 16, immediately after converting Lydia and a small group of other people, that Paul faced opposition. Paul faced persecution. Paul and Silas ended up in prison for a period of Acts chapter 16. So as soon as he could get out of there and move on, he found himself in Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas traveling through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and he came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And you know what Paul does as soon as he arrives in a community. If there's Jewish believers and there's Sabbath believers, and you know what he's going to do. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue for their service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And he said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Notice the the gospel that he used. The gospel referencing prophecy, referencing the suffering, but referencing hope beyond the grave. This gospel, of course, most importantly is not about us. It's about Jesus. And it's the Jesus who is the Messiah, the one who will save you from your sins. Half of the gospel is that you're a sinner, but the better half of the gospel, the good news half of the gospel, is that he's a savior. And so in response to this, people hear this good news, hear this hope beyond the grave, the fact that God has been pointing to it and and everything Jesus is all about, and they hear it and they respond. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek women and quite a few prominent women. We have men and women, Jew and Gentile, people from every, uh, like all demographics joining the church. Can I get an Amen. Well, unfortunately, not everyone in church gave an amen to that one. And I don't necessarily mean this church. I mean the church of Thessalonica. Because in response to the good news, transforming lives and giving hope to people, there's always going to be somebody who sees the glass a little differently. Some of the Jews were jealous. 
So they gathered some troublemakers. This is one reason I, I do appreciate the New Living Translation is they, they give fun words like troublemakers. Um, it's, it's not quite the, the pirate Bible from last year. I don't know what kind of scallywag sh- word showed up in the, my gift from the school from last year. I'll have to look this up. But they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They figure the best way to respond to, to God changing lives is to cause chaos. The more that God brings hope and order to people's lives, the more the devil wants to undo that. And so they're going to cause a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason. And by the way, who's Jason? I don't know, it's just some guy in Thessalonica. He doesn't show up hardly anywhere else. He's just some guy. But he drug him out And some of the other believers, instead, they grabbed them instead of Paul and Silas. They took them before the city council, and they said, Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they are here disturbing our city, too. It is... Here's the crazy thing. On the one hand, is that, like, slanderous? They've caused trouble all over the world? Is that slanderous? Because this is the gospel trouble. Tempted to say no, but to the world is the gospel trouble? It is. Because the gospel runs contrary to the world. The gospel doesn't, stand, doesn't fall for the things that the world is all about. Jesus is thinking much higher than what this world has to offer. And so part of me is like, yeah, they're lying about them, but really? They're totally, ta- cause, they're, they're totally telling the truth. Because Paul and Silas are causing trouble for this world. Because they're calling people out of it. They're calling them to something better, something higher. This is part of the gospel. Don't live for this world. Live for something better. Jason welcomed them into his home. Is why they targeted Jason. So he says they're all guilty of treason against Caesar. For they profess allegiance to another king. A king named Jesus. Now, I don't have to give you too many Bible studies to talk about King Jesus, right? Of all the different names and all the different hats that Jesus wears, sometimes rabbi, sometimes he's the, you know, he's the teacher, but he's a miracle worker. We've had a chance to look in depth. You remember last fall when we had a chance to study Jesus sitting on his throne, Jesus becoming king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus in all of his majesty in heaven, And that one day soon when we will get to experience him in his fullness, thanks to all of those prophecies. Remember, this is a message grounded in prophecy. If you haven't had a chance to study books of prophecy, but you're new here and you miss those messages and they're not on our YouTube archives, unfortunately, and our Facebook page is still down because the devil is still causing chaos in this world. If you haven't had a chance to get into those books of prophecy, but you want to, let me know. I love studying prophecy. And I'll gladly take you through some of those great books of the, of the Bible. But that's the same message that, that Paul used to this church. And their response to it, they fought him. They argued with him. And Paul and Silas had to flee. They ran from Thessalonica to Berea. And of course, as soon as they arrived there, what did they do? Got back to work. So you remember our... our, our map here you see them they've had a chance to they've moved from philippi where they face trouble to thessalonica where they face trouble but they go down to berea do you remember what happened when they arrived in berea were they well received in fact very well received the people of berea were more open-minded than those in thessalonica it says in Acts 17 verse 11 they listened eagerly to paul's message they searched the scriptures day after day to see if paul and silas were teaching the truth it is fantastic to have a church that will take the, they'll hear the preacher's presentation and say, I appreciate it, but how does it compare to the word of God? One of the things that I do encourage my congregation to do from time to time is to evaluate me. I've had a chance as a pastor to go through elementary school, middle school, high school, undergrad, seminary. I've, I've been in school for like 20 years. I'm used to tests, I'm used to evaluation, I'm used to feedback, and I welcome constructive feedback. But the thing I look for with constructive feedback 
Sometimes I appreciate your preferences. Some of you may like that I hold my remote with my right hand. Some of you would prefer I use my left hand because my hand might be distracting. And some of that is preferences. You know what is an absolute? This right here. If I am ever off from the word of God, set me straight. Okay? That's what the Berean church did for Paul, and he appreciated it. You'll notice the fond words that Luke uses as he reflects, as he wrote the book of Acts, on how the people of Berea responded. And how did they respond? As a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. We see people converting when they hear the gospel. It is a life-changing gospel. And for every amen, there's going to be a... But unfortunately, in this case, the grumble is from outside. Because guess what? Verse 13 When some of the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there to stir up trouble instead. They followed them from town to town, basically what we see here, chasing them around Greece. And unfortunately, we find that the believers acted at once, and they had to send Paul onto the coast, while Silas and Timothy remained behind. It is at this point, for the rest of Acts chapter 17, um, yeah, the, the rest of Acts chapter 17, that Paul does his ministry from Corinth. This is his chance to go to Corinth, to make those connections, to share the good news, and to build those relationships with that troubled church and city, this community. So good news. Finally, Paul is safe. Yeah, finally, Paul is safe. He's been persecuted in Philippi. He's been persecuted in Thessalonica. He's been persecuted in Berea. He's finally safe in that wonderful haven of Christianity known as Corinth. But something is is on his mind. Was his church safe? You notice that when he left, he left Silas and Timothy behind. He didn't want the devil to win. He didn't want the naysayers and the, what what was the word, the troublemakers? He didn't want those people to come in and to disrupt God's hard work, to disrupt all of the good news and discourage them and to break down the believers until they submit back to the world and they fall back in line. And so he's wrestling with, is his church safe? Well, thankfully, after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent his time preaching the word. Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 18 had a chance to come and to share the report. And that report ends up becoming the foundation for the message that he would then write from Corinth in approximately AD 51 or 52 to the message of the Thessalonian people. The message has a simple outline. He opens with a prayer, he closes with a prayer, and he has a prayer in the middle. The first half of the book is that he is actually encouraged by their faithfulness, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the second half of the book is to then encourage continued faithfulness. It's a simple structure. It's a beautiful book. And I hope you have a chance to read it sometime. But you'll notice that he, when he opens with prayer, He reflects on their past. He talks about how when he came to preach to them, he says, For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. When we came to share these good news with you, the Holy Spirit came with us. And you know our concern for you from the way we live when we lived with you. Er, And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. In other words, it wasn't just what we said to reflect the gospel. It's what we did to reflect the gospel. And so you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. When it talks about this idea, you received the message with joy in spite of the suffering it brought you. What are we talking about here? Well, unfortunately... Remember that these people, you had Jewish believers. And how did the Jews respond to you walking away from the community? 
not well. What did they do in response to Paul bringing people outside of, of the good, happy faith? They chased them all over Greece. But what about those Greek believers? What did it mean for them to accept Jesus Christ? What did they have to give up? Idolatry was a major issue of the Greco-Roman world. The pantheon of gods is legendary. This community no doubt had its own regional gods and goddesses like we talked about in Ephesus, their worship of Diana, Artemis. Each community, every group of people has its own idols and gods and deities that are fundamental to their identity. And so individual homes may have had their own individual gods that they had trusted in, these statues and these ideas. And all of a sudden, they're hearing something better. That's good news for them. But how do their friends receive that? How does their family receive that? How does their neighbor receive that? Hey, I know I used to believe what you believe, but I found something better. Is that how it came across, do you think? Do you ever have that, that connection sometimes when, when you want to share your gospel, you want to share your good news, and, and the response, it, it seems to be this challenge of, do you think you're better than me? You ever hear the accusation of holier than thou? It's going to cause trouble, not just for Paul, but for anyone who hears this good news and responds. They are going to have to deal with suffering. You, you basically, what he's saying is, you people, you gave up your past, you gave up your idols, your families, your community, because you recognize that your only hope for a future is in Jesus. I know that this has been comfortable. This has helped you before, but it doesn't help you anymore. Jesus is the only thing that will help you going forward. And so he makes reference to this. He says at the end of, of ver or chapter 1, they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. They realize that their idols, that their worldliness is going to get them nowhere. Only in Jesus do we have a somewhere. And so they keep their eyes focused, not on their past and their traditions and their, everything that they're used to. They're willing to give all of that up to keep their eyes focused forward on the future. In fact, it is this reference to the second coming that becomes a major theme for the book of 1 Thessalonians. This call to the second coming, this reference of what Jesus is going to do, the coming of God's Son, this is a major theme of Thessalonians, and every chapter of 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the second coming. Every single one, in fact, to this point, we've only had, if I remember correctly, like two gospels of the two months that we've been studying gospel, or two epistles. Only two epistles have made any reference to the second coming at all. This one has it in every chapter, and in fact, large portions of some of these chapters. And you'll notice they're right in the middle. That reference to the second coming in chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, that is actually the prayer that divides section 1 from section 2. Now, section 1, like I said, encouraged by faithfulness. Where was Paul encouraged by their faithfulness? Not only the fact that they could look ahead in spite of their suffering, but from his own responses and his own messages from Silas and Timothy. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea because of their belief in Jesus Christ, uh, who, because of their belief in Jesus Christ, suffered from their own people, the Jews. Basically, what he's saying to them is, you decided to be faithful just as Jesus was faithful through his persecutions. And you know what he says when he hears reports like that? He says in chapter 3 and verse 8, it gives us new life to know that you're standing firm in the Lord. Your faithfulness, your decision to stand up from God, even when everybody else is, is bowing down over here and sitting down over there, your decision to stand up and go forward for God is an inspiration. 
not just for other people. When Paul says it gives us new life, that includes him. The pastor is encouraged to see you standing firm while you go through your hard times. When you decide to stand up for God, when you have to deal with grief and pain and death in your family, in your circles, in your friends, in your life, This month, of course, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. A couple of weeks ago, we had Pink Sabbath. Some of you have had to deal with physical, emotional. Some of you had to deal with financial. Some of you have had to go through all sorts of incredible tribulations and tragedies because you decided to stand firm on on your faith in Jesus Christ. Your decision to not let this world hold you down, but to let God pick you up, that gives strength to people like me. To know that God is working, that this church is worth fighting for, that God is active here. He's active here and here and here and here and here, and it gives me hope to know that he might be active there too. So keep up the good work. Keep fighting the fight, because there is a fight worth fighting. We're not just going to back down and let the world win. When persecution, when hard times come on the Thessalonian people or the Casparian people, God doesn't back down, God steps up. And so in response to this, it gives us new life to know that you're standing firm in the faith. And the hope that we find here is that prayer. May God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ bring us to you soon so we can get together again. But he says, may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. And his prayer to you people there in this this prayer that's the biting point. He says, may you as a result make your hearts strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again with all of his holy people. Amen. So that's the call. Be strong, be blameless, be holy. Love one another. Love all people. And let it just overflow. That is the appeal that the second half of the book is all about. As you've gone through hard times, and you've already gone through it, we are getting ready for a time yet to come. You think what the devil's been doing is is the hard part? We haven't seen anything yet. He hasn't thrown his best at us yet. We know we're going to go through hard times. We know that we're going to see some of his best temptations and his best tribulations. We know that the devil is going to work harder than ever with what is yet to come. But for every minute that Satan is working hard, God is working twice as hard. And so I'm encouraged by what you have gone through. I want to encourage you for what you're about to go through is the structure of Thessalonians. He actually says, chapter 4 and verse 1, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God, as we've already taught you. You live this way already, And we encourage you to do so even more. And the second half, he encourages them with three specific goals. A life of Jesus is full of holiness, love, and hope. And those become the key words of chapter 4. He encourages them with holiness in their relationships, starting in chapter 4 and verse 3. He encourages them to use loving witnesses to their neighbors and their friends in chapter 4, starting in verse 8. And of course, live a life that's full of hope in that famous passage in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. That passage that talks about the second coming of Jesus, that hope of the resurrection that we can all have, that hope of that happily ever after, whether you are alive through your persecutions or if this world knocks you down and you have to rest, to know that there is a hope that God will pick you up and make it all right forevermore. And I appreciate the fact that that section ends with verse 18. So encourage each other with these words. Just a simple message of how are you today. It's a chance to say, I'm having a bad day. The devil's working hard. I'm tired. I'm hungry pastor won't stop talking, whatever you're, whatever's in your way. (laughs) 
but there's an opportunity for encouragement because today is not forever. A better day is coming soon. So encourage each other. Chapter 5 gives us this final encouragement that the hope of tomorrow should influence how we live today. One of the things as as a Seventh-day Adventist is that we live with that Advent hope in our hearts, that hope of the the soon coming. We live with that hope. And in fact, it is that hope of the soon coming of Jesus that was grounded in what happened this past week, what is known as the Great Disappointment. When in October 22nd, 1844, we thought Jesus was coming and there would be no more days and we could experience forever. But we didn't. Jesus didn't come. We were wrong in how we interpreted that prophecy. But this is why I appreciate when William Miller, who admittedly had come up with seven different dates based on different interpretations of different sections of Scripture, from 1843 to 1844, when the seventh one finally rolled around on October 22nd, 1844, came and went, somebody went to William Miller and said, Hey, have you had a chance to study it out and to find another date yet? Do we know the date that Jesus is coming? And he says, I have. I want to be ready every single, or I want to be ready today, 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 every day until Jesus comes. The hope of tomorrow should influence how we live today. And it is that passage that, that Tom read for our, our scripture reading, I didn't want to put it up on the slides because I'm going to wear out my batteries clicking through it. You know, those verses came so fast. But that encouragement to the Thessalonian and the Casparian people. Always be joyful, Paul wrote in chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit, don't scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said and hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of people. And so, dear friends, the message of 1 Thessalonians and the message for today is that the gospel is your past, your present, and your future. Many of our epistles have focused on our past and our present, but this one especially drives home with every single chapter that Jesus is coming again. And so I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have a second coming oriented, Eric's already kind of shuffling in his seat, I think he knows what's going on next. (laughs) He heard me say Jesus is coming again. He knows that that's the name of our closing song, second coming coming oriented song, this reminder that Jesus is coming again. And so my encouragement to you, it'll be on the screens most likely, but it is also in your hymnals, number 213. Our song today is going to be that anthem that we use as we go forward. It's a reminder that tomorrow is coming, and so we need to get it right today. And keep going today, 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 every day until Jesus comes again. Stand and sing.